Hi friends, welcome to Law Chat with Gerja. My name is Gerja Bhargav Patel. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I am a podcaster, I am an educator, I am a businesswoman, I am an entrepreneur, and I'm a lawyer. I truly believe in the power of mentorship through storytelling, and that's what Law Chat is all about. So whether you are in six months or 10 years of business experience, we can all learn from each other's experiences because we face the same challenges and we have the victories and we have mistakes that we're all making. So why not lean into them and know that we're going to be fine and we're going to be okay and we're going to be inspired. And of course, this is Law Chat with Gerja, so we will be talking about some law at some point during the conversation. And if you love what you hear today, which I know you will, then subscribe to Law Chat with Gerja and share the love. So grab your coffee, sparkling water or wine, and let's dive in to the next inspiring mentorship session. Hi friends, welcome to Law Chat with Gerja. I am not just excited, not just thrilled, but extremely humbled and it's like a full circle of life happening with me right now with my guest today, Kinsey Roberts. She is one of the first podcasts that I started listening to very diligently, but also in a very niche industry of professional wedding industry type of a podcast. And I mean, it's not just that she just has amazing business advice coming out of her podcast. Also, she is a host of two podcasts called She Creates Business and The Venue Podcast. But she's also an owner of a venue, beautifully located and very ideally located in Colorado. And if you ever listen to her podcast and her describing where she lives, I mean, you're just like, can I live there with you? Because it just sounds so nice. But Kinsey, more than anything, I was just telling her right before we started is that she impacted my life in such a beautiful way where when things were confusing or when I was in a season of where am I going and a hard season, her podcast really lifted me up and her podcast it was one of those things where from afar, I was the biggest fan. And today I'm fangirling like nobody else's business. And I am just so grateful to have you on Law Chat with us today, Kinsey. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I cannot tell you how much it means to me. I was telling Girja offline that 2021 was kind of a tough year for me. So this feels so good. And I just appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you having me. Yes, of course. And I think I just forgot to even mention how you are a coach for wedding and event businesses and professionals out there also. And you've successfully hosted 100 plus events annually. And you are a wedding pro. Like people know you in the industry. You're not just like some random person. You are a celebrity in the industry. And so, (laughs) but I want to know how this started because I also know that you live in an area that is not as populated, in an area right. that is farmland more than anything else, just sounds so dreamy to me. I, I can't even, like, <laughs> like I want to live there. But how did it start? Like, where did this whole idea come of owning a venue and podcast yeah. and making a space for yourself in an industry that didn't even realize that we needed this space? Yeah, gosh, that's a good question. So yeah, one of those is very easy to answer, which is the idea for the venue came from my sister-in-law. Her name is Katie. She had gotten married in the area where we live many years ago. And many years ago, she had a hard time finding a venue. And so she kind of kept that nugget tucked in her brain of it would be great to have some sort of space here for events. It would be great to have some sort of space here for events. Right. And she kind of just kept that little nugget with her over the years. And in 20, 20- 15, late 2015, I would say, or mid 2015, I was leaving my corporate marketing job to return to the ranch where I live now, where the venue is with my husband and our family. And we kind of just, you know, through a series of conversations brought up the idea of a venue again. And I just said, I'm leaving my job. You've always wanted to do this. I feel like we could do it. And that's how it happened. It was like, okay, sounds great. And we got our LLC in February of 2016. And we've been, you know, head on ever since. So that's really how the venue started. So that's an easy answer. The podcast is also an easy answer. Now, carving out a space or becoming, you know, becoming someone in the industry, that was pure accident. I had no plan for that. I had no sort of preconceived notion that that would be for me or that that's even what I wanted. 
I was just an avid podcast listener. I bought my first microphone in 2014 and I kept it in the box in my extra storage room in my house because I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And I was embarrassed, (laughs) but I just knew that I wanted to be a Pat Flynn or, you know, I wanted to be a Michael Stelzner. Those were two of my favorite podcasts at the time. And I sat on that microphone for two years. And then I was lucky enough to attend a conference called Creative at Heart in Denver, Colorado in 2016. And I was on the wedding planner group. So they separated us into small groups so that you could get some value, some additional value out of the conference. And they put me with the planners because I was the only venue owner at that time at the conference. They did not know what to do with me. They were like, oh, we'll just put you with the planners because, you know, otherwise you'd be alone. And that's where I met some of the most amazing women who were the first guests on my podcast. And before I left that conference in July of 2016, I said, that's what my podcast is going to be about. I'm going to interview women in the wedding industry because I feel so comfortable here and I feel so supported and I just want to make friends. I'm moving back to the ranch, which was a little tough for me when I was younger. I lived here. Derek and I married when we were super young. Derek's my husband. We lived here for a couple of years. It was really hard because I didn't understand ranch life. I had come from the city. And so I wanted to make friends and I especially wanted to make friends in the industry. And that's why I started my podcast. So July, 2016 is when I finally said, cool, now I get to use this microphone. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And I launched in September of 2016. Wow. That's amazing. I I want to rewind a little bit because I love the connections that you made and a creator at heart shout out to Cash Moyer. She was on my podcast some time ago as well. in one of the first few episodes when I first launched her creative at heart conference is fantastic. I went last year to it. Unfortunately, this year it got canceled and I was like crying, but I I was bummed, but the connections that you make and not just at creative at heart, but at other conferences can really catapult you to the next level of whatever your heart's desiring, but then also just connections and people in the industries and The rewinding a little bit, I wanted to talk about your experience. Like when you started this venue, did you have any experience in the wedding industry? What were you doing before that? I had no experience in the wedding industry other than when I was younger, like in my formative school years. And when I was trying to go to college, which spoiler alert, I did not graduate. I worked in hospitality. I was a bar manager, a cocktail waitress. I managed wait staff at a country club and we did a lot of weddings there. That is the extent of my experience, which is none. My actual role and my actual skill set is in marketing and visibility. And that's what I was doing before we started the venue was corporate marketing in the real estate industry at the time. And so, yeah, I had no wedding experience at all. I wasn't like, I sort of planned my own wedding, but I always tell this, I always say it this way. I was never like other wedding pros who are like, I planned my own wedding and I loved it. So I got in the industry or I picked up a camera for the first time when I was five and I've been doing it ever since. Like (laughs) not at all. Basically I had a cool job in marketing. That's what I've been doing for the last 12 years. And I had to find something else to do. And I was like, you know, I've always wanted to have my own business. I freelanced here and there. And so we just started from there. I was like, this seems like a really good opportunity. Did my research, multi-billion dollar industry, holla, we're in. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I wanted to ask you because I'm sure there's listeners out there today that are kind of like, well, we're in our nine to five. We're doing well. We're comfortable. Yeah. We're crushing it, but they're not getting a full fulfillment out of whatever they're doing. But then there's this whole other thing that their heart's desiring or like things that they've talked about or heard about, but they're like, this is crazy. I I have zero experience. I just don't even know, but you jumped into it. You did it. Yes. I heard you say you did some research to kind of like probably make you feel better about your decision that you're about to make (laughs) and to solidify this, this, you know, direction that you're taking. And then when you started the venue at that time, you said you started with your Mm sister-in-law and was it something that was like, Oh, we have space. Let's do it. Or was this something that you both were like, okay, how are we going to do this? Like, what was the process that happened then? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and you're right. I think that when we started the process, it was eight years ago. Yeah. When we started, obviously. So seven or eight years ago, because it took us a couple of years to build the venue or about a year and a half, I guess. Mm -hmm. But we really just jumped in. I did a little bit of research and I don't want that to sound too fancy. I simply just wanted to know what does the industry kind of look like? And that's, you know, can we make money? What does that mean? And I started, you know, that's how I found the Creative at Heart Conference was and and Catch Moyer. And that whole bit was doing that research and then realizing, oh, interesting. There's a community of business owners online who 
also own wedding businesses, you know? Yeah. And so Yes, I did a little bit of research. So I don't think people should be afraid to jump. I think that we can kind of research ourselves to death. And I think there's a little bit of peace in having that naivete, right? I, I was naive in the beginning. And I think there is actually a lot of benefit to that because you're so much less worried about what people think or what you should do. You know what I mean? So I, I protect that a little bit. I don't, I don't, that's not to say go into things blind and just like burn your money, but it is to say, you know, protect that a little bit. And because you're not going to know, you don't know what you don't know. You could exactly. research all day. You don't know what you don't know. You just got to get in, like get your hands dirty, get in there. I'll answer the rest of your question here, but I'll just tell everyone right now. Like I thought I really prepared, ready to go to host our first wedding. We had that first wedding. It was wild. And I like changed 50 things about my contract the next day um, <laughs> that I just had. You no, know, I was like, if we can get through this wedding, we can literally do anything because <laughs> it was wild. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I sat at my computer and I was like, changed so many things. So anyway, you have to get in there and, yeah. and work it out for yourself. But no, we didn't have the space. It wasn't like we just had a venue and we swept it out and said, we host weddings now. It was actually quite a long process. We built our own venue. Our family, my father-in-law did and still does own the property that we have. So that was, you know, we had the property, which is a, when people ask me about owning a venue and they're like, oh, that just must be a cash cow. And it's like, (laughs) uh, it's very expensive to get started. And it also takes a ton of work. So we have the land and most people don't. So it's a huge expense at the beginning, whether you have the land or not, but we built it from the ground up. And I mentioned that it was my sister-in-law Katie's idea. Uh, She really had a heavy hand in designing the building. And I basically was like, it needs to be white on the inside. I want it to be white on the outside. Like it needs to be light colored. I think we should focus on weddings because we can be destination. So I kind of turned us towards being a wedding niche instead of just like hosting any event that wants to come through the doors based on that research that I did at the beginning. And she worked really closely with our building manufacturer because they didn't know what to do with us, you know, much like creative at heart at that time. I'm not saying, you know, there were certainly privately owned venues. Absolutely. But not so much like going to conferences and out and about really. And so this company that we worked with to design the venue, they didn't know what to do with us either. So she really worked hand in hand with them, lucky them. And anyway, yeah, so we built it, took about 14 months. We opened our doors in 2017, May 2017, and you know, kind of haven't looked back since. Wow, that is amazing! And not only that, you have beautiful scenery. So, I mean, it's just there's a lot of plus points happening. But yeah, it's an awesome spot. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it does take a lot of time and effort. And I think mm-hmm. there is so much merit to ignorance being bliss. Also, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a lot of times with me. Also, there's a lot of ignorance, but I'm going in with so much you know, positivity, but then also optimism and maybe it's naive optimism, but whatever, it just ends up working out and it ends up, you know, falling into place. Ignorance is great, but never in law because it's never a defense. FYI, but, uh, (laughs) listen to Gerja. I feel like I always have like, okay, side note, this like sometimes people are like, oh, but we just didn't know. I'm like, that just does not cut it anymore. Like not knowing is not an answer. Fair enough. (laughs) But yeah, I think there is some merit to having that naivety and kind of just moving forward in your, this is what we're going to do. So now fast forward and, you know, you started a podcast and you have, um, guys, you really need to listen to this podcast. Like she creates business has been going on for a while. There's amazing guests that come on there and just so much good thoughts for your soul, but then also like practical tips for your business. Also, like, I mean, there's some really good practical tips in there. So I I really like it a lot. And the venue podcast, when did you start that? Let's see. I co-host the venue podcast with Lindsay Lucas. She is a venue consultant and we started the show. Oh my gosh. I don't, I'm going to have to look at my iTunes app y'all, because I think we started in early 2020 or maybe even 2019. We took a little bit of a hiatus because she had a baby, but yeah, gosh, 2020, I'm just going to say 20, nope, 2019. Just kidding. We started it in 2019, (laughs) took a bit of a hiatus. Now we're back full fledged here in 2022 and it's been delightful. I really enjoy it. Of course, I am a venue owner. Lindsay is a venue consultant, like I mentioned. And so it's been really nice for us to just be able to really dig deep into venue specific information because, you know, as you mentioned on She Creates Business, I cover a wide range of topics in the wedding industry. 
and even outside of the wedding industry, yeah. because I think it's important to get education from a lot of different sources and we can be inspired from people who are doing great things or doing awesome things, but they're not necessarily in the wedding industry specifically. So the venue podcast has been a really fun project with my good friend, Lindsay, because we can just dig into venue topics specifically. It's that really, really niche audience or niche, what, however you like. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, it's, it's nice to go deep rather than wide. Yeah, I think that is so cool because, you know, there's a lot of niche podcasts out there, but it's nice mm -hmm. to be able to tune into something that is so specific to what mm -hmm. a person is doing or in their industry. So now throughout all, you know, hosting podcasts and having a venue, you're also a marketing coach for wedding pros. Mm -hmm. And so what is that? And when did that start? I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I have to stop and talk with you about the number one thing I'm asked about by entrepreneurs, contracts. They're vital to any business relationship and to protect your business. But I also know that entrepreneurs, especially when you're starting up, money is tight, but I would never want you to compromise on a strong legal foundation. So enter your contractbuddy.com, a website created by me with contract templates created and drafted by me and fellow industry partners. They're ready to use and easy to plug in immediately. And they are not restricted to any specific state. So yourcontractbuddy.com is sponsoring this episode and you and your listener can get 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. Yes, you heard me right. 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. And now back to our awesome conversation. So for me, that really started, I, you know, I mentioned my background and my training is in marketing. That's I'm not a venue owner or wedding professional by training or anything like that. I didn't go to school for hospitality. So really my entire professional career has been in marketing aside from, you know, when I was in college doing those bar gigs, right. Those, uh, those hospitality gigs, but so it's always something I was interested in. I think it's why Vista View, I don't think, I know it's why Vista View events had early success and continues to have success because as you mentioned, we are in a rural location. My venue is three hours away from the major airport in our state. It's outside of a town of less than 10,000 people. And yet we are booked every single year. So I think our marketing and our visibility strategy has a lot to do with it. And I just naturally started getting questions from the podcast. You know, it's something else that was a bit of an accident. I wasn't looking to go into the industry and certainly not the podcast I mentioned. I just did that to make friends and to have something to do when I wasn't doing the venue. It just sort of naturally started happening in 2017, about a year after I launched the show. They saw the success of my own venue. They saw the success of the podcast. And they said, you know, we're struggling with my wedding planning business, my photography business, my venue business. Can you help us? And at first the answer was like, no, thanks. Um, this is just not what I'm doing uh, right now. You know, I'm really focused on marketing my own things. And I just don't know. I just want to make, you know, I was, even though I've done it, you know, for companies in various industries and I feel like I'm great at it, I just was, you know, nervous and I didn't want to put my hands on someone's personal business. I really do feel as if it was because it was someone's personal, privately owned mm -hmm. business. And I, gosh, I just didn't want to mess anything up for them. I, you know, it's, it's such a different feeling than when you're working in corporate. Yeah. It's just, I just know from being a business owner myself, how precious our businesses are to us. And I just could not put my hands on it for a while. So at first I was like, no, thanks, but here's a couple tips. And then I thought, you know, Kinsey, you can do this. You'll treat their business as if it was your own you know what they're asking. You have the answers. At the very least, I'm a strong researcher. I can point them in the right direction. And I have this skill at where I know enough to be dangerous about a lot of things. And so like if somebody wants to come to me and they're like, hey, I want to self-publish a book in the industry to make me more of an expert. Awesome. I know where to send you for that. Yeah. Uh, but if somebody comes to me and they say, hey, actually, what I want to do is create a visibility strategy around Instagram stories. I also know about that. And so I just decided to go for it. So I privately coach clients one on one. That has really been my favorite. I have a few digital products. And yeah, we were kind of off to the races in 2017. That's fantastic. I like how you talked yourself through overcoming the fear that you had. Now, is there something else that you also had to do in order to overcome that hurdle that you were creating for yourself? before you started, you know, coaching one-on-one? -on -one. Gosh, you know, I think one of the hurdles for me is just the, I am an eight on the Enneagram. So I'm like a visionary and I love like the big picture and I love to move forward really quickly. And so for me, I mean, just pragmatically and practically speaking, one of my biggest hurdles was like, 
putting together packages. What does this look like for a human? You know, cause you can ask me questions all day, but it's like, okay, what do I charge? How do I put these packages together? What are these digital products? Because, you know, it's not enough just to decide, like, listen, I will treat someone's business as if it were my own, like I say, and then I will go forward and do it because people need specific things to choose from because they know what their problem is. And I knew that I had to have something like a menu from people to choose from. So like I say, pragmatically speaking, it was, it was challenging for me to like really break that up and figure out, okay, package one, two, three, these are my digital products. And then of course, listen, those things do not create themselves overnight. If you're going to have any product, whether it's service-based, whether it's a digital product, there's no such thing as passive income. I don't like the person who made up that word. Um, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, But yeah. So, I mean, just to be totally honest with you, that takes work. It does. It does. Digital products are not easy to create. Even if it's a freebie that you're giving to somebody, it's still a lot of work that's gone into it. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of times we just like, oh, it's free. It's on the internet. Anybody can get it. And there's the value of it is really diminished because it's so easily accessible. Mm -hmm. But digital products are not easy to create. I mean, I have a digital contract shop also, and it's not easy. You have to maintain it. You have to update it. You have to put more product out there. And it's just like, Exactly. Well, and for you, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking of your shop and I was like, gosh, it is is something else probably to maintain those contracts because you do have to update them. You know, the law is not static. It doesn't change as fast as other things can, but absolutely it is. There's a lot of background work that goes into it. You know, so much much. on the front side for whoever's purchasing it. You're like, great. That was easy for you. But gosh, you know, I bet you have 30 plus hours into each contract or more. I think so. I mean, well, it's a lot. Not to mention your education. (laughs) Well, you know, I think also like even for you in general, it's just, it's one thing to create something which takes Mm. time. It's one thing to make sure that you're also putting the best product out there. If that is the goal, right. To put the best product out there, but then also the tech side of it is so daunting, so daunting. And I think like there's so many like elements to create this digital product, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like actual creation, the tech side of it, which is not just putting it up there, but it's making sure that all the dots connect, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm putting up my product. Now, when somebody wants to buy it, like, how do we do that? Like, all of that has to be set up also. And then, of course, you know, the marketing of it, like, there's just so much that goes into it. You are not wrong. There is so much. And to your point, absolutely. Even if you create this amazing thing, nobody knows if nobody knows. So what comes after that is all of the strategy, right? That marketing and visibility strategy, like we're back to it. Market to me, marketing, and and I think everyone should feel this way, of course, because it's my passion, but marketing and visibility is the lifeblood of your business. If you're not doing it, your business Mm -hmm. will die. Uh, and that's just the reality you yeah. actively have to be doing it. And that is the same is true, whether your products, your digital products, your services, your packages, whatever they are, whether they are free or not, you know, like there's a method and there's a point to having free products. Mm-hmm. It's not just so people can say like, oh, this is such a great thing from Girja. You know what I mean? But then you want to take them down your email funnel. Eventually you want them to get your paid service. And so of course you should take those just as seriously when you're marketing. Yes. We're so lucky now, right? That there's so many great tools like Kajabi, like Squarespace, like Show It, Flowdesk, all of these things that will automatically deliver these digital products for your clients, but you still have to set it up on the background. But I think of, you know, the old school marketers like Shalene Johnson, where they had, they were actually like coding their stuff, you know, to make yeah. things happen. So we're very lucky that we still have the tools to do it uh, so much more easily than they did in those years, but you still got to set it up. So yeah, exactly. it totally takes time. You still have to set it up. You still have to write that email. And I agree. There's so many amazing tools out there, not just tools, but they're amazing people who actually can help you figure those tools out also, because that's my thing. Like I have a hard time, just the whole tech side of it. Like it just takes me 10 times longer than the person who just knows how to do it. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I'm just like, what am I giving away? And what am I keeping on on my plate? Oh my gosh. Yes. And t- I agree with you. The The folks who have really niched down and they are serving the people, like they have niched down to creating templates and stuff for different software products. They're my favorite. I just love those people. Like mm-hmm. I think of who's one that I really love. Oh, the boss project. They really specialize in templates for Dubsado, which is a CRM system and Flowdesk, which is an email system. And so, and they have a bunch of other stuff too, but like they specialize in just completely done for you templates. And then there's another gal, 
what is her name? Amanda Genther, I believe is her last name. And it's called, I cannot remember what her website is called, but she does sales pages, like totally done for you sales pages and templates and stuff for Kajabi, which is an amazing, like all in one tool. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So yeah, I, to your point, absolutely. I love these folks who've like really found their niche in creating <laughs> templates for the rest of us because yes. I don't want to create a sales page. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. It is lots and lots of work. It's like what my daughter said, mommy, just because you create a website doesn't mean people know about it. And I'm like, Hmm, put it so on a t-shirt. Insight. So, so much, much insight. insight. So that takes me to the whole marketing and visibility aspect of your expertise and, you know, part of your business now. And so what are some tips that you could give to others about marketing and visibility? Like where do we start and what are some things that we absolutely need to be doing? Absolutely. So the first tip I like to give is the first tip because it applies to people who are just getting started or if you've been in business for a decade, like I have. So this tip really, anybody can do it. And this, this first tip is to never lose your network. Mm -hmm. In-person networking, building your relationships, and more importantly, maintaining your relationships, no matter what industry you're in, is always going to be one of the cogs in your marketing wheel, always. This is something that you can do online, like Girja and I are doing. Her and I have never met in person, right? But now we are part of each other's networks. And I know that we'll both maintain this relationship because I just, I feel like I've known you forever. But yeah. also, you know, but also because we're two women in business, we're moms, you know, we have a lot in common um, and we can support each other that way. So never negate your network and continue to grow your network. And I, if I could, again, just shine a light on the most important part of that, which is to really um, keep your network up. And so a lot of you might be thinking like, gross, Kinsey, I don't want to go to networking events. I don't even own business cards anymore. It's 2022. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, Sarah, Why? I don't. I know what? people are like, do you have a business card? And I'm like, no, save the trees. But my website has everything you need to know. <laughs> save I promise. The trees. Save the trees, yo. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but I'm not kidding about not having business cards. But really what I want to shine a light on is if you're thinking, okay, Kinsey, I, or, or you're thinking, I go to networking stuff. It's not working. First of all, I'd love for you to take a good long look at how you've been networking and really have some self-awareness. Are you someone who's been going to these events and you can't shut up about your own business? Are you someone who's trying to slap your business card, digital or otherwise, in every person's hands, whether they need your services or not, because you haven't taken the time to do that? And again, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings here, but I just really want you to have some self-awareness about that because that's not the way. That's not the right way. We are talking yeah. about servant networking here. You need to figure out how you can serve other people, how you can benefit their business. And then that is what creates relationships that you can sustain. One of the things that I really like to give advice on when it comes to marketing in this way is to become the host of a networking opportunity for other people. That is what happened to She Creates Business. I mean, that's what that's really how I became, you know, as I, I wouldn't say this myself, but you said it. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna that's how I became like a guy in the industry. You know what I mean? Like the guy or like this this gal that people know is simply because I created an opportunity for other people to have the floor on a podcast. That's yeah. it. And so if you can create an opportunity for other people to have the floor, uh, you know, I have it easy. I have a venue, so I can do that really easily, but there's lots of ways to do it. And it doesn't have to be an event for 20, 30, 50 people it can be a monthly event for 10 people. It can be a quarterly event for 50 people. So if you could really think through those things, you would be shocked what happens when you become the purveyor of an event so that other people have the stage. They're just automatically attracted to you because you are naturally serving those people. So that's I my love, first tip. love that advice. I'm sorry for interjecting right here. I love that advice because a lot of times we want to be the person that's going to the events, mm -hmm. but if you host the events and provide a platform for people to connect and hello in zoom world, everything is possible now. I mean, yeah. I've been able to connect with people across the globe mm -hmm. because of zoom. And in my, while zoom may not be my most favorite way of meeting people all the time, but it definitely is a way for me to meet people who I probably would never meet otherwise. Oh, that's exactly right. Like you and I is such a great example. I do hope we get to meet in person someday. I'm sure there's a conference where our paths will cross. Absolutely. But in the meantime, this is an excellent way. I feel like we are, we're really just getting into the meat of things we both enjoy, which is talking about business. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's so funny when I think about, you know, I'm nobody, I'm, I'm nobody. 
I just, you know, I'm like a gal who like lives on a ranch in Colorado. I'm a mom. I go to PTA meetings. Like I'm just a nobody, but (laughs) my podcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm planning the book fair at my kid's school. (laughs) Yeah. Like I'm just a nerd uh, who likes history. Like I'm just a nobody, but my podcast makes other people someone and you don't have to start a podcast if you're nervous about it, but I like to use that as an example. And I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. There's people are begging for opportunities to feel like someone and our, our mutual friend, Megan Gillikin, she always uses this quote from Mary Kay Ash, the founder of Mary Kay cosmetics. It's from Mary Kay's book. Uh, and Mary Kay says, pretend like everybody is wearing a sign that says, make me feel important. Oh, uh, wow. I love that. Yeah. Megan always shares that quote and I never forget it. Uh, yes. In fact, I used it in a job description the other day because I think <laughs> it is so valuable. So anyway, that's tip number one. And a lot of people forget about it. People, when they first come to me, they're like, Hey, can you help me with social media? And I'm like, I can, uh, but hold the phone and let's back up that train real quick because I don't give a shit what's happening on your Instagram. If you don't have these other really foundational principles go- happening, pardon my language. I completely agree with you. I think social media is wonderful, but at the same time, if you're not really doing anything and your work is not speaking for you, the way you are handling relationships and showing up, yeah. it's not happening. Then social media is nothing. Garbage. Yeah, yeah. it's garbage. And I also realized this, um, just last year, I was just like, gosh, I'm spending so much time on social media. Like I don't really like spend time scrolling through other people's stuff, but just my stuff, like trying to yeah. put it. I'm trying to put it out there. I'm like, where is this getting me mentally? Where is this getting me? Like, where am I finding fulfillment? I find more fulfillment completing a contract for a client because I've check marked a box for myself. And I'm like, yes, done. Not that I don't like to show up for social media because I believe it to be a platform where I can educate and spread the goodness of the law. But like at the same time, I'm like, It's definitely not where all your eggs should not be in one basket in that sense for marketing. I completely agree. And an acronym that I love to use that I hope uh, for for you listening, I hope you'll take this with you is SDOS. And to me, that stands for stay discerning on social. And what that means is put it in its proper place. Is it actually bringing you clients? Is it actually bringing you money? What is the point of social in your business? I have not been consistent on Facebook in over two years. It has not hurt my business. It one iota not even a little bit, not even a fraction of a fraction of a percentage. And I used to spend so much of my time and effort over there. And I think that to your point, Girja, I love the way you said that, like, what is this actually doing for me? If you don't actually know what it's doing for you, if you cannot actually say, this is how much time I spend on social media, I spend 11 hours a week on it. And this is how many clients it brought me. It was Tommy, Susie, Jimmy, Brittany, and Kinsey. Then there's literally no point in you killing yourself over making reels that probably look ridiculous, uh, unless you know how, no offense, uh, unless you know how it's impacting your business. So S D O S stay discerning on social, like, listen, 2020, who remembers clubhouse raising my hand. I spent quite a bit of time on clubhouse for a couple of months. I deleted the app from my phone Same has here. an impact on my business one iota. So does anybody remember vine? Raise your hand. If you do, if you don't, there's a good reason that you don't because it, it shut down. <laughs> like, I don't who remembers- remember it coming into like yeah. becoming something. So. Yeah. Oh, and it was like when I was at 2013 doing real estate marketing, the college kids loved it. Mm. Uh, vine uh, doesn't even exist anymore. Who remembers Periscope doesn't even exist anymore. So I really just want yeah. you to understand how I'm not saying that social isn't for you. I'm not saying delete your social media app. Um, do you do you, but you really do need to understand if you don't understand the data behind your social, then how can you have a plan around it? And not only that, know why you're doing it. Like how are you talking about? Like, how is it impacting me? But yeah, you know, like know how much time you want to put into it on a weekly basis or a daily Mm -hmm. basis, but why are you using it? Is it to generate conversion? like, you know, uh, audience to clients, or are you using it to create authority for yourself in an industry so more people watch you? Or are you using it just to spread like just marketing, like exposure? So the idea is like, what is your goal? And then what are some metrics that are matching that goal in order to make sure that you're in alignment with the purpose? Because at the end of the day, social media is marketing, like you cannot look at it anything but like that now. And especially if you're doing free business. And so I just feel like there needs to be a plan of action. 
There does. And a really simple plan of action is to number one, as Girja says, figure out why you're doing it. And then after that, create your posting schedule because really in marketing, consistency wins. That's really the reality of the situation. A lot of people think you have to go viral and you have to be funky and you have to do all of these great, amazing things that are so hard. And I need to hire a college student because they're the only ones who get TikTok. And, and, the, and the real answer is that consistency wins. Your competitors are going to die out. Eventually they're going to stop. And if you're the guy who stays on all the time or gal, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if you're the person who stays all the time, you're consistent, you show up every single day in whatever marketing medium that, that matters to you. Yeah. Consistency wins the day. I always like to look at studies from really challenging times as a country or nationally or internationally. And so when you look at like the pandemic in 1918, or when you look at the Great Depression, uh, when you look at World War II, companies that really rose above the rest of companies were those that did not actually cut their marketing spend. Mm -hmm. They actually went all in on their marketing and all in on their spend during that time. And they're the ones that just catapulted. Uh, they still exist today. They had their largest growth when that happened. And so it's not to say, you know, be stupid with your money, you know, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. But it is, it is just such a foundational principle for you have got to be consistent. And really the other thing that I see a lot in marketing, when, whenever someone comes to me and they're struggling to book clients, they're struggling to convert. A lot of it has to do with number one, like I said, they want to talk about social media and that's not even where their clients are coming from. And number two, they're not consistent. Always, 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 always. Never does someone come to me and they say, I've been blogging consistently once a week for five years. I put those blogs on Pinterest once a week, every day for five years. It's always like, oh, we do this here and there. So if yeah. you leave with two things about marketing, keep tra track of your relationships and create new ones and treat people well. Servant networking is what I like to call it and consistently do something to market yeah. your business and then talk yeah. to me about how things are working. I love that. And kind of going hand in hand with the servant um, networking that you were talking about is also talking about the businesses that thrive during the downturn are businesses that also show up for their community. That's right. They're the ones that, yeah, they're consistently there. They're, they're not cutting in the marketing, but their marketing now they've also added the whole aspect of goodwill mm -hmm. into service to the community and showing up for them in the best way that they can show up in the way that they can do what they can do and impact. And so while it might seem like, oh, okay, well, you're doing it for personal reasons and it seems selfish and it is a form of marketing in a way when you are doing something for your community, but don't forget that the impact that you leave behind is what people want to keep going back to. Like I'm from Houston and we have a grocery store called HEB here. Oh yeah. Okay. It's like the best thing that's ever happened. And like, everybody's missing out <laughs> because it is amazing. But HEB they show up when we've had our crazy, you know, hurricanes, crazy mm -hmm. flooding, crazy times during, you know, COVID and like shutdowns and this and that, man, they were innovative in the way they serve their community. Yeah. They're the people that are like, once there was like this crazy torrential rainstorm that happened and I happened to be in a HEV and all the lights went out and they allowed people to just walk away with grocery. They were like, don't worry about it. Walk away. We're, we, we're not going to deal with this right now. You walk away. Wow. I'm like, who does that? They do. And they're thriving. HEB does. They're, <laughs> they're thriving. They're thriving. about them because the impact they leave, they make you feel good. They make you feel like there's a bigger community out there, even though you're, I'm living in one of the fourth largest cities, mm -hmm. but you feel like there are people and companies that truly care about their community members. And those companies thrive. Oh my gosh. Yes, exactly. And that is servant leadership, right? Like yeah. they are taking a leadership role in their communities by saying we're the first ones on scene with groceries when it comes to power outages or hurricanes, or we're the first ones to donate when the local baseball team comes or whatever it is. Right. So exactly like, just like networking. I mean, that's, that's just another step. That's another wheel in the cog. I love that example so much. And Right when you say, what's funny is I know HEB. There are no HEBs in Colorado where I live, but I know that grocery chain <laughs> because yeah. for some reason, like I've heard of them, that is power. Like that is power in marketing. They are only in Texas and they own one of the largest shares of groceries in Texas. Like I think they're in even nationally, they stand in the top five, even nationally. I'm thinking this, I'm not doing research that? to like support this, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. <laughs> so. Yeah, guys don't like write this on your tombstone. Okay. We don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, get, getting back to marketing and visibility, I know you talked about servant networking, which I love, love, love the way you described that and talked about it. Consistency, which is everything also. And is there anything else that people need to know about? Yeah. Yeah. One of the pragmatic, practical things that you can start doing um, as soon as like I, and I like to give these in, in order. So start with number one, number two should be a given for all of these. And number three, I'm actually going to say two things. The first is that your website should be a 24 seven marketer for you. And if your website is not just absolutely crushing it, then I encourage you to take a good long look at it. My question to you is this, here's where you can start. When was the last time you looked at your website just on the front end, not on the back end as a consumer on your desktop and on your mobile and on your tablet? Are all of your links working? Do you have amazing SEO or even just good SEO? Are your pages navigable? Does it look good on a tablet and mobile? Are you getting into your customer's head when it comes to your website? It should really just be crushing it for you. There's no reason not to have a website and there's certainly not a good reason to have an excellent one in any industry. There are, like we talked about earlier, there's just so we're so lucky because people used to have to code their own websites. WordPress was the only option. It was terrible. And now there's so many not just done for you websites, but now you can buy templates for yeah. pretty much any website and have it installed for you. I just bought a template off of Etsy for a new Squarespace site for a new business that I have. And I'm so happy with it. And it took literally five minutes and 200 bucks. Mm. Like, yes, please. So your website should really be working for you. And sort of along those same lines is what are you creating that is owned content by you? That's why this goes hand in hand. I would love to see people start consistently. That's number two, right? Uh, consistently creating owned video content. And this is so important. One of the pushback that I get a lot from my client is I don't want to be on video. I don't want my face to be on video. Um, and I'm like, that's cute that you think I automatically think you should be the one on video. And I don't, I really need people to start thinking outside of the box here. You can create video without putting your face on it. Can your team? team be on video. If you don't have a team, that's okay. Can you create static posts, like static slides uh, with music background? You know what I mean? Like we really need to start thinking outside of the box here because the point is not your face, right? We instantly go inside and think of ourselves like, oh gosh, how nervous am I going to be? It's all about me. It's not about you. It's about the person watching it. It's right. about the information you're providing and you can provide just as good information, whether it's someone else's face, who's comfortable on video, or it's just static image posts with text information. Do you know mm -hmm. how many views? Here's an example. This is funny. I don't think people think of this. Do you know how many views those videos on YouTube get that are like lyrics to songs? <laughs> That's nobody's face. And I'm out here trying to learn lyrics to the songs that all the kids know. <laughs> so I can be cool. <laughs> I'm just saying that you really, really, you really need to start to understand that when it comes to video, it is all about serving the client. It's not about your face. So just get mm -hmm. over that. Nobody cares. You can get some really easy tools from Amazon to oh, like right. take a video from high up also where you can, if you're cooking or if you're creating something, then this, your phone or whatever can perch up yes. and like, well, there's a lot of tools out there on Amazon and they're not expensive, yes. absolutely doable, absolutely achievable. And if you're not finding time, because you feel like you don't have time, block out time where you're dedicated to doing that work during the week. And you just have to do it once in a month even and just block yeah. it out and create like batch it up and create like five videos or something. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think batch working, especially when it comes to video, it helps people feel more confident because maybe at video one that day, they're not, they haven't found their groove yet, but it's still okay. But by video four and you only need four per month, right? There's four weeks in a month. Uh, you have really feeling great. And so, it, and then you're done and then you're done for yeah. a whole 30 days. But to your point, there's so many great tools. And you know, if you're some, a food blogger, you can show your food, you can show you cooking food, you can show snippets from your latest cookbook or your latest drink recipe or whatever it is. Or, you know, I follow this gal who is a financial planner and she's super big on paper planning. That is her thing. She really feels like it's beneficial to budgeting and all of this. So a lot of her video is actually her like setting up her planner each week because that's how she does it. It's her hands and her planner. And there's so much tactile response to that, right? Like yeah. there's this whole sort of movement. It's not, I don't, I don't know what I would call it. And I don't even know what this stands for, but it's the acronym ASMR. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's basically like sound 
hormones that create like an emotional response for people. So there's, here's an example. It's super weird. There's literally people on YouTube who just eat. Oh my God. I was just thinking that. That's what it is. The eating people, like the the eating eating people. Y'all. Half the time you only see their mouth. You'd and only see them. It's weird, right? And they intentionally make the sound of eating a higher volume. And I, I, they may even add some stuff on the background to like enhance the sounds or add more sound to it. But you're right. The eating yes. videos are yes. so viral, even with kids. Like they're just- They're so watching. viral. They're, they're bizarre. They're not even they're... eating cutely. Like <laughs> No. They're like slurping up like hot wings. It's weird. Yeah. It's so I mean, I'm into it for them. Oh. But listen- look at their views. Right. And so they, like the point of that is not to say be weird or like you have to do something so uh, outlandish to get, to go viral. But the point of that is to say that people are wanting to feel some kind of way and that there is, it takes all kinds, right? It takes all kinds that when it comes to video. So back to kind of the point we were talking about is, is your website really knocking it out of the park for you? And if you need help with that, you've got to find someone who could, what does that mean? If you're like, I don't know what it means. I don't know if my website's knocking it out of the park, then you really need to find someone to tell you yes or no. And to find a way to create consistent video or consistent content, I'd love it to be video that you own. That is the key term here in my advice. You if you want to create reels, that's okay. Own. Yes. But can go down at any time. So what are you owning? What's consistent? How are you keeping track of your data? And how are you moving forward with that data and using it to inform future marketing activity? Love, love, love every single thing that you have shared with us today yeah. has been so helpful. And video is definitely something if you're not there, you need to start hanging out there. And like you said, it doesn't have to be your face. It can be, I mean, even like the sound of coffee being brewed is a thing yeah. or yeah. like boiling of water is yep. a thing. Right. And totally. so, and if you're not getting ideas and you want inspiration, hang out on Instagram, hang out on TikTok a little bit and see what jives with you and what you believe would be going well with your audience or how you want to present yourself as well. Be on brand please. But yeah, like you know, definitely feel like what, what aligns with you the best and then move forward. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. There's so many creative ways, you know, for Vista View events, we do a lot of reels, but it's never my face right now. I just, and I don't know if it ever will be, Mm. um, but it's simply because I want the spotlight to be on our couples and I'm trying to create inspiration for our future clients. Our reels do well for us. And it's always, always, always weddings. Yeah. Uh, it's always like we try to use trending music and it's, it's just weddings. Like it's yeah. just our, we have huge portfolios. We're lucky enough to get all of our photos from most of our photographers. And so we have a lot of visual content, but it's not me dancing around and pointing to words and stuff. Not that that's mm-hmm. bad. Um, but that's not my thing, you know, like, you. Yeah. yeah, it's not who I am. Yeah. I, and I'm not saying that you can't do that, or I'm not saying that I'll never change. You know, we're not monoliths. You don't have to operate in a silo. You can do new things, Yeah, but those were great for us. And you don't see my face once. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And just a side note on the legal side that if you are using your clients images or voices or whatever that is literally your clients faces there, their voices there, please get permission. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually that permission can come just through the contract that you sign with them. Mm -hmm. But just make sure they're okay with it. Yes. We, yeah. I'm so glad you said that. I have a clause in my contract that says you understand that I'm going to use your pictures in all of my marketing. Yeah. And also to that point, if someone, if you have that in your contract and someone requests that you remove it, I think that's such an easy way. That's the one clause in my contract that I'll remove. It's such an easy way to delight the client to say, absolutely. I'd be more than happy to respect your privacy. And I take it out and and nobody has ever asked me once, once someone asked me anyway. So it's such a, it's one of the only clauses I'll ever change in my contract because I'm proud of my contract and it protects us and it protects them. Mm -hmm. But it's such an easy way to delight a client by um, honoring their their request for privacy. Absolutely. And they have the right to also say no. And so if they, if they do that, it's just such, you're just creating a better business relationship when you are Mm. okay to compromise on something that doesn't really impact the bigger picture, because you probably already have a big portfolio of stuff anyways, that you can use. And sometimes people are just super private and they don't want to you know, use their images or their voices and whatnot. But oh. thanks to you so much for being here with us and sharing all of this amazing information. There's a couple of questions I still have. Okay. And, you know, like the challenges overall, what is one big challenge that you faced and how did you overcome it? Oh man. Well, 
I'll talk about a recent challenge that I've had, and I've mentioned this to you offline, is that at the end of December, as we're recording this, at the end of December 2021, I actually bought my partner out of the wedding venue. So we operated the venue together for six years. And then I just knew that it was it's something I had been marinating on for about a year. And I knew that in the best interest of the business and really what the business needed to go to the next level, whatever that was going to be, I knew that it needed one owner. And so I offered to either buy it or to sell it. And I ended up being the one who bought it. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised. I was so excited. It still hasn't sunk in almost yet, but that was challenging because like I mentioned, we worked together for six years. Partnerships can be challenging in a variety of ways anyway. And so when you're buying or selling something, a business specifically in this in this case, there's a lot that goes into that. And I know you know, as an attorney, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of negotiating. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of awkward and sometimes annoying conversations. It really taught me a lot about myself. It taught me some lessons in how I can improve my communication with other human beings. It was hard in the moment. Uh, It definitely was the right move. I don't regret it for a second, but it taught me, like I say, it taught me a lot about how I need to communicate and how I can be better at that uh, so that things don't perhaps escalate uh, to where they could or what have you, you know, not that it was, not that it was really, you know, an escalated issue, but yeah, it was it, buying, buying a business is a big deal. It so is. It's a communication huge deal. is really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a huge deal. And I mean, in general, when you are in a partnership with one or more persons, it's like a marriage and business. And sometimes that dissolution of that relationship can be painful. It can cause a ripple effect into other areas of your life as well. And so they're very hard conversations. You should have a partnership agreement if you don't Mm -hmm. have one, because that truly helps navigate those really tough situations sometimes if the partnership agreement is done the right way. Mm -hmm. And it helps you to kind of figure out on a very practical way of how to get out of those icky situations that are just so uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. because I'm pretty sure you've probably had very uncomfortable conversations that you just didn't even know how to approach or how to tackle. And so before you walk through the door to have that uncomfortable conversation, what was going through your brain at that time? Like, what were you thinking? And was there something that you helped your mindset in order to even open that door to Mm. walk through it? Yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned that I'd been kind of marinating on buying or selling for about a year and it took me that long to come to the conclusion because, you know, I love my business. I love Vista View events. And I had to reconcile with, you know, at, at the, in the moment, I did not think I would be the one getting it uh, right. up until I knew that I was. Uh, and so I had really resigned myself to being the one selling it. And so that felt, that was emotional for me because yeah. I love Vista View events. And, but I knew, like I said, I knew that it was in the best interest of the business to have one owner steering the ship from here on out, because we're really at that. We were really at this kind of critical point yeah. of growth or not. Right. And so my mindset was, it took me time to come to the conclusion. And I think that that is okay. That's what I needed. I don't apologize for that. I, and I mentioned this to you that I, when I make a decision, it feels abrupt for someone else because I don't share my feelings with a lot of people. And so when, when I, when it came time to have that conversation, it probably felt a little abrupt and that was a bummer, but you know, I am who I am. So I can't regret, you know, how I process big decisions. So my mindset really it took me a year to get into the right frame of mind to make that decision. Mm. That's a huge decision. Like it's a huge trigger pull. And so it took me 12 months to do it. And I think that a lot of times I love a proper resolution. I'm an eight on the Enneagram. (laughs) So I love to like get in, make a decision and whether it was right or wrong, like we'll figure it out later. Uh, And so it was, it was a huge learning experience for me in waiting so long but I required that time. My brain and my body required that time because as I mentioned, I didn't think I'd be the one who got the business. And so it took me some time to reconcile with that. And I think when I look back, the only thing that I would have done differently probably is, is my delivery. Uh, But other than that, the first, I've never bought or sold a business before. This is the first time. 
So right. I'm not a pro. I don't make any preconception that I am a professional. And of course I was going to make mistakes. Like, and if yeah. I ever do it again, I'm going to make mistakes again. And yeah. uh, I just don't feel bad about that. I think that's one you know blessing that I have. I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to be embarrassed uh, when it comes to things that I try and fail at. And that's kind of what saved me was that, listen, mm-hmm. I've never done this before. So here we yeah. go. Yeah. And I, I like how you also are just like, I needed that one year and you you knew yourself. And yeah. so sometimes whether it's selling a business or not, or there's other big decisions and you're marinating in it, it's okay. That mm-hmm. time is okay. And then maybe you, you should ask yourself, why am I thinking about it so much? What is the reason I'm not pushed forward? What's holding me back? Because sometimes those can be really insightful on the mm-hmm. direction we do need to take. Right. And so, yes. I love the way you said that. That is insightful. That's your intuition. That's your intuition protecting you. That's your intuition helping you make a good decision and just feel comfortable and feel like peace and rest in whatever amount of time that you need, you know, still show up for the thing. Like in my case, even though I was looking at trying to make that decision, I still had to show up as the other owner for a whole year. You know what I mean? It's not, you can't negate your responsibility and that can feel tough sometimes. Uh, yeah. but you've got to, you can't negate yeah. your responsibility. Um, but yeah, I just, it's okay to rest in that time, whatever time period you need or whatever length of time rather. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Also. I know that's something very fresh and new still so yeah. thanks for sharing that. I yeah, appreciate it. Great. So that kind of takes me to my last question is what is your anchor in life when things are chaotic? And when you are feeling a little like, Ooh, okay, I can be flown away in five seconds. What's the anchor that holds you down? Oh my gosh. It's my husband (laughs) without a doubt. I don't have to think about that for a second. Uh, Derek has, we've been together for 15 years. I mean, I think I was telling you offline. I can't remember. We got married really young, but we have really like grown up together and he has supported me through everything. He helped me with this buyout. He helped me with the venue. I mean, he's been, he helped, he was part of the team that built the venue. (laughs) Like He's just seen it all, you know, like he's seen me when I was working like these weird jobs in hospitality. He's seen me through my marketing career. He's seen me and supported me. That's, that's really the key though, right? Mm -hmm. Is that I have never felt, I, and I know how lucky and privileged I am, but Derek has never been someone who has ever made me feel guilty or less than for trying to achieve my dreams or someone who just doesn't care. Like someone Mm -hmm. who's apathetic, like cool. Like you're starting a podcast. Yay for you. You know, I just think back to years ago when I reached 10,000 downloads total, (laughs) uh, you know, now the podcast gets 15,000 a month. You know what I mean? But like when I reached 10,000 downloads total, he took me out to dinner, uh, like as a celebration, you know what I mean? So anyway, I can't imagine my life without someone as supportive as my husband, who is just like, yeah, you want to buy a business? Let's do that. Uh, yeah. You want to start a podcast? Let's do that. You want to start a coffee brand? Spoiler alert. We'll talk about that later. You, let's do that. Like he's just, he's just, Can I, I love him. him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, girl. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to that question is oh my gosh, I love that. Um, I, I cannot agree with you more. Having a supportive spouse and then, or a partner in life. Partner. Yeah. <laughs> You also being that supportive partner too, though, like people, it goes both ways. Oh, so it's so important yes. that you show up for when they need it, however big or small, but for them, it might be big, you know, even though you're like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> but showing up and being supportive of them is so important. And I agree. I think even on my end, it's been really nice because the same thing, like my, my husband is so supportive. Yeah. And we'll literally like turn over everything just so I can figure out and make it to what I need to do. And yes. that's everything. It's everything. And, and we are so lucky like you and I, and I just, the one thing I want to say is that, you know, if you're not married or you don't have a supportive partner or uh, what, whatever it is, I just want to say that support can come in all different forms. Yeah. And I think it's important that we know that you can't, I, I believe this and I might be alone here, but I truly believe you cannot get everything from one person. That's mm-hmm. not fair to that person. And so there has to be different people in your life where you get things from. So like Derek is my anchor and my rock and he knows everything about me, but you know, my friend, Megan, my friend, Lindsay, my mom, and if for you, if it, if for someone else, it could be a therapist or whatever, like a group, a peer group, whatever it is, it's okay to get what you need from more than one person. Yes. You know, there's things that I talk about with Megan and Lindsay, because we are working moms and entrepreneurs that I, I don't talk about to with my, uh, with my husband all the time, simply because he cannot relate. He is not a woman. (laughs) 
he is not a mom. He's not, you know, and that I don't hold that against him whatsoever. Uh, and I think that, like I said, anyway, it's important to, that we know that it's okay to get what we need from, from different people, not in a secret keeping way, but just in a supportive, Hey, uh, I'm not just going to word vomit on you all day, every single day time, because it's important, you know, that's not good for them either. Yeah. I think it's so nice that you just said that because you're right. Support can come in many different forms and it can come from many different people as well. And whether that's other individuals or groups out there, it's definitely other sources of strength. And with you know, if there, again, there might be people in your life that are super, super close to you and they just don't get it. And it's okay. Mm. It's okay because that the dream that you have in your life, in your heart, the ideas that you have, the vision that you have is yours. If it was theirs, they would understand they would be in alignment. Yeah. So it's okay. If some of the most closest people that you believe in your life are not aligned with you because they just don't understand. And sometimes it's okay to say, that's okay. I still love you, but you're not my person right now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You just, if that was the only thing on this show, absolutely. You have got, we as entrepreneurs and we as business owners and creative human beings, if I could, you have got to bless and release those people from the obligation of supporting and understanding every single thing you do. That is not their role in your life. And that's not their fault. Yeah. (laughs) That's okay. okay. Yeah. Just bless and release that person's obligation. You can still love them. Uh, they are just not the person you need in your season of being an entrepreneur. They are the, maybe they're just the person you need to get coffee with and talk about something else. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've got to learn how to release those people. Talk about real housewives, you know, that's a thing too. So it's okay. Oh my gosh. Thank you. So I could like literally keep talking to you. So, um, we do been like the fastest hour of my life. I didn't, I'm like looking, I'm like, okay, we need to like, thank you so much for thank being you. with us today. You have shared nuggets of wisdom along with some of your phrases, which I totally love bless and release. Yes. And then also take your heart, but take your brain with you too. Yeah. Follow your heart, <laughs> but take your brain with you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. Thank you. I love your energy. I love the things that you shared with us today. Truly, truly. This is such a special moment for me. So thank you. Likewise. It's been a huge pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining Law Chat with Gerja. I just love these kind of conversations. Conversations that are motivating, inspiring, the truthful, raw, and honest about all of the challenges, all of the victories, all of the triumphs, picking ourselves back up again. I just can't think of a better way to get mentorship but Law Chat with Gerja. If this was helpful to you or this was inspiring to you, please share the love. You can give this video a thumbs up. You can subscribe to this channel. You can also share this with your community by taking a screenshot and posting it on your social media and tagging GBP Law. When you do that, a lot more people will be able to see this video that not only benefited you, but also can benefit them as well. So let's share that love and let's share that inspiration. And if you want more information about what I do and other resources, go check out gbplaw.com or yourcontractbuddy.com. And I look forward to seeing you next time.